Thank you all very much for taking the time to participate in this. We've got just a wonderful uh, group of folks here to have a discussion that I think is going to be a really interesting discussion. Uh, obviously, the only thing anybody seems to be talking about these days are the effects of COVID-19, its impact on Americans. But um, often the conversation revolves around its effect on adults. And in my opinion, we haven't had enough of a public conversation about the impact that the prolonged lockdown is having on our kids. And so uh, this is why I'm so grateful to have you all here today to offer your perspective on this. And we're gonna focus specifically on the tremendous benefits that children uh, derive from participating in organized sports. Uh, the physical benefits are educational benefits, social benefits, character building benefits. It's all very real, it's all very important. And I think the bottom line for me is uh, I wanna help to figure out how we get kids playing sports again and safely. Uh, and especially uh, baseball and softball. And as the father of three kids, including a 10-year-old, I have a real personal interest in this. I know my 10-year-old wants to get back to playing Little League Baseball. I do want to acknowledge there are some very real challenges that face youth sports organizations, in addition to the obvious challenge of bringing kids back safely, which is paramount. For example, youth sports leagues across the country are facing their own financial difficulties, as most institutions are. And I know that many parents are understandably facing apprehensions about whether or not it's a good idea to allow their children to play in these sports. So one of the questions that we'll try to address today is how do we know if and when youth sports are safe for our kids? And if so, how do we do it? How do we do it safely? Um, in many parts of the country, most of the country, and very much in my home state of Pennsylvania, the curve that we talked about, the curve of the rate of COVID-19 infections wasn't just bent, it was really very significantly diminished relative to the peak that we were afraid might have happened. It's also become completely obvious for weeks now that we are not gonna overwhelm our hospitals, definitely not in Pennsylvania, and I don't, I don't think anywhere else in the country. And since we have slowed down the rate of transmission, and since there is no longer a danger that our hospitals are gonna be overwhelmed, I think it is time that we begin resuming normal life. And, and that has been happening to varying degrees in the, uh, the states across the country. I think reopening our, our respective states should be data driven. And what does the data show? Among other things, the data shows that social distancing, right? Wearing masks, enhanced sanitation and hygiene, these things reduce the rate of transmission in the general population. And so I think these measures ought to continue. The data also shows that nursing home residents, uh, older people, people with compromised immune systems are much more vulnerable to this disease than the general population is. And so nursing home residents, for instance, should be protected and prioritized for testing and personal protective equipment by all means. But the data also tells us that the risk for children is very, very low. It's really great news for kids. In fact, the CDC website states that for children under the age of 18, COVID-19, I'm quoting now, COVID-19 hospitalization rates are much lower than influenza hospitalization rates at comparable time points during recent influenza seasons, end quote. And then there's a study of CDC data that found that this year's ordinary annual flu season, which we're all accustomed to a flu season, has been 21 times more dangerous to kids under the age of 14 than COVID-19 has been. The data also shows that children appear to be far less likely to transmit the virus than adults are. There's a study in Australia that looked at nine infected students and nine infected staff in 15 schools and 863 close contacts of those infected individuals that were all investigated. Only two students identified as secondary cases from the 18 cases, and there was no evidence at all in that study of children infecting teachers. Uh, the European Union uh, CDC also noted that the data indicates that children are unlikely to be a primary so source of cases um, or, or outbreak starters. Um, finally, their data is increasingly showing that the likelihood of COVID-19 transmission is significantly lessened simply by being out of doors 
the virus doesn't do very well up against sunshine and warm temperatures. So this is all really encouraging to me and I, and I, and I hope our viewers as well. Um, the, the findings and the data lend themselves to the conclusion that I, that I think anyway, that we can resume youth recreation and we can do it safely, especially if we continue the common sense practices that we know reduce the rate of transmission. And with summer right around the corner, this means that that time honored American tradition of youth baseball and youth softball with all the health and developmental benefits that come with them should be available to our boys and girls. And as I said, I have a 10 year old son and if we could resume little league baseball in, where I live, I would sign him up tomorrow because I'm convinced that this can be done safely. Now today's panel, we're gonna uh, discuss a number of things, important information on how youth baseball and softball can safely resume. We'll get some medical insight into why youth sports are relatively low risk. And hopefully we'll be able to provide some reassurance for parents who would like to get their kids on a field this summer, I'm sure. With that, I wanna introduce our, our panelists. This is an amazing panel and I'm really, really grateful to each of you for taking the time to be here. I'm gonna introduce all of you first, and then I'll go back and recognize each of you sequentially for your opening remarks after I've gotten through the introduction. So first I wanna introduce uh, Dr. J. Bhattacharya, Bhattacharya, is that right? Close, I'm getting close. I apologize, doctor, but I'm grateful that you're here. Um, Dr. Bhattacharya is a professor of medicine and the director of the program on medical outcomes at Stanford University. He's also a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford. He's going to discuss especially the medical implications of resuming organized youth, youth baseball and softball. And he can also speak to some of the groundbreaking research he has done about understanding better the prevalence of COVID-19 among the general population, including uh, an antibody study that was conducted by Major League Baseball. We also have with us Tony Reagans. I'm very grateful to Tony for joining us. He's the Executive Vice President for Baseball and Softball Development for Major League Baseball. Prior to his current role, Mr. Reagans was the General Manager for the Los Angeles Angels, where he earned the American League Executive of the Year in 2008. Mr. Reagans also has the distinction of drafting Mike Trout, one of the best players in baseball in 2009. And he's gonna discuss for us well, we, we, there's, there's parochial and, and local, <laughs> localized issues here, Tony. Um, uh, he's going to discuss Major League Baseball's efforts to engage with youth throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and how the Major League Baseball's youth programs can begin to resume this summer. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have with us uh, Jenny Finch. Uh, Jenny Finch is the Olympic softball gold and silver medalist, youth softball ambassador for Major League Baseball, Mrs. Finch is a retired two-time professional all-star softball player, a member of the U.S. Uh, in the United States Softball Hall of Fame. Time Magazine once described her as the most famous softball player in history. So I'm really grateful that Mrs. Finch would join us to talk about the positive impact softball has for young female athletes and her views about how we can resume play safely. And I'm uh, very, very excited to introduce Jimmy Rollins. Um, Jimmy's going to speak about his experience as an alumnus of the Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities program and the value of organized baseball for our youth. Jimmy, of course, enjoyed a 17-year career in Major League Baseball, 15 of which were with the Philadelphia Phillies, the best shortstop in franchise history. Jimmy won the National League's Most Valuable Player Award in 2007 and was an essential part of the team's 2008 World Series victory. I'm grateful that Jimmy could be with us. And then finally, I am really pleased to introduce my constituent, uh, Stephen Keener. He is the president and CEO of Little League and I'm grateful that he could join us today. Mr. Keener has spent a 40 year career, including more than 25 years as the president of Little League, 25 years, quarter of a century as the president of Little League, enriching, helping to enrich the lives of um, boys and girls all across the globe at this point uh, through his efforts to grow the games of baseball and softball. Of course, in Pennsylvania, we're a little biased and we're extremely proud of the Little League World Series, a truly unique and special event that brings out such a wonderful opportunity for kids all around the world. And Mr. Keenan will speak to the efforts being taken by Little League to help their affiliates across the country 
begin to play safely. He'll also touch on the impact that the canceled Little League World Series will have on Williamsport, Pennsylvania. So again, thank you all very much for being with us. I'm gonna ask you each to speak for a few minutes. We've said three minutes. If it goes a little longer than that, that's okay. And to start off, um, I'm, I'm gonna recognize uh, Dr. Batacharia. Thank you very much for joining us. You've got the floor for uh, three minutes. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me, and, and thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts about this. I think very, very important, uh, uh, important matter. So the first point I want to make uh, is that if you can design appropriate safety protocols, youth baseball and youth softball are the absolute perfect place to start to start to think about uh, resuming uh, sports uh, for for lots of reasons that I'll, I'll, I'll get into. But uh, just first, in the nature of of the sport itself. You, you have social distancing sort of on the field imposed just almost by the rules of the sport. Um, so I think that, that lends itself to some uh, so, so, sort of making it an ideal case. Um, there will need to be a lot of careful thinking about how to protect both the participants of the, the, the kids as well as the, the you know, potentially parents who are on the field or, or, or you know, in, the, in the area and uh, you know, coaches and, and other folks. So, a lot of, I think a lot of data-driven work will need to be done to make sure that, 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 that the sport can be uh, opened safely. Um, uh, you know, questions about how, you know, mask wearing, uh, you know, sort of hand, you know, hand washing, uh, all of the things that we've become accustomed to in American life in the last couple of months will all have to take some role in the reopen sport, I believe. Um, that we're going to have to think very carefully about that. Uh, but I think if you if you think about all of the sports that you you know potentially could could reopen, in my opinion, baseball and softball are among the top that is as sort of likely the safest in that in the, in the sense that you could impose these kinds of uh, uh, so that, that sort of you can impose these sort of norms that we've come to come to expect for protecting one another from from COVID infections. Um, second, I want to I want to uh, completely agree with you. Uh, Senator Toomey, about the benefits of youth sports. Uh, I am the worst athlete in this in this panel by far, uh, and I, I, did, I, I was not a successful athlete. But uh, what I did do has impacted my life enormously. Um, I mean, I think uh, youth sports contributes in meaningful ways to the, the health and well-being, uh, not just of kids, but the kids all throughout their life. I believe. Um, you, you. Uh, so, just I'll just list a couple of things. I think uh, the folks on the panel can can uh, speak to this better than me. But you, you build habits of, a, of an active lifestyle that, that potentially last throughout your adult life. Um, you, you know, I mean, th those those have enormous effects all throughout your life. So, for instance, uh, addressing uh, obesity, not just youth obesity, but obesity later in life. If you're active in sports, potentially you have tools that you wouldn't otherwise have um, throughout your life. Uh, second, I think uh, it fosters a sense of sort of striving, especially team sports, striving together, trying to improve. These are psychological benefits that youth can have through other activities, of course, but youth sports provide them in spade. And so I think uh, that's, that's, I think, a very, very important under under uh, emphasized benefit um, of, of youth sports. I think uh, cutting, you know, sort of, the, especially I think we've seen, I have three kids also, uh, uh, Senator Jimmy, and, and uh, the, the isolation that uh, the, the kids have been experiencing, I think, will have enormous negative effects on them. Um, and I think starting to think about reopening will have, uh, will have a lot of benefits, uh, you know, so especially if they can be done safely. And the third, I'm just going to talk very briefly about the, about the evidence, because you, you summarized some of the evidence regarding how, how dangerous, uh, dangerous COVID-19 is to children. Uh, the evidence says, suggests very strongly, I think, that kids are much less likely to suffer from the negative harms of COVID infection than adults. Uh, I think to date, there's only been 15 children nationwide that, uh, that, have, that have died from COVID-19, 15 versus the, you know, um, you know almost 100,000 that we're seeing dead from other, from, uh, from, from, from adults and others. Um, so for, for reasons we don't fully understand from a scientific point of view, kids seem protected Against the the harms of COVID nineteen, um, the, uh, the 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 second uh, thing is I want to emphasize is, uh, from the evidence is is uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna pick one study, but I think there's now several now that that suggest something very similar. It's very unlikely that kids will pass the COVID nineteen infection to their parents or to the, to adults. It almost always runs the other direction. And I'll just give you one study. There's a study done in Iceland where some scientists sequenced the genome of every single COVID-19 virus that they found, and they, they, they 
uh, sam you know, sampled, I think, 12 or 13 percent of the, the population. And they, what they did look for is mutations in those genes of the, of the virus. And from the, the mutation patterns, you can tell whether who passed the virus to whom, or at least in, in a statistical sense. What they concluded was that there was no evidence at all of any infections passed from kids to parents or to adults, zero. Um, now, there's, I think there may be some other cases where you can point to, point, point to say that, that, that there are some. I mean, you can't say there's literally zero, but we, you can, uh, you know, because there's always, there's always a possibility. But we can say pretty certainly is that it's, very, it's much less likely than the other way around, where, where adults pass the, the virus to the kids. Um, so in that sense, the kids, uh, kids represent a, a very, very strong case for be, sort of a, as a, a safe, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a lower risk of, of harm from COVID infection, both to people that they that they live with, their parents, as well as to them to to, uh, to themselves, because they die at much lower rates from having COVID infection. Uh, finally, I want to address a, a, a study uh, and a concern that that's been raised about Kawasaki's disease, which is a very rare condition that uh, that happens in 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 kids. Uh, I mean, I think less than uh, you know. To, 20 and up to 100,000, a, very, a, rare, a rare condition. That's very severe and, and you know, difficult condition to cope with, but nevertheless very rare. There's some evidence that COVID infection raises the risk of Kawasaki's disease. So the, the, there was a study recently in The Lancet focused on the Italian, uh, the Italian uh, region of Bergamo. And what they found in a, in a, in a major hospital in Bergamo is that, uh, that the rate of Kawasaki's disease had gone up during the COVID era. Uh, during the previous 60 months before the COVID era, there had been tw roughly 20 cases of Kawasaki's diagnosed at the hospital. And then in the two months since COVID, they found 10, saying that there's a 30 times increase, I think is the, is the headline, in the risk of Kawasaki's disease. If you multiply that out, it turns out to be about 40, 40 as well. You should be careful because only, only eight of those 10 were found to actually have the virus. So, but let, if you multiply that out, it roughly comes to around 40 to 50 case, extra cases of Kawasaki's a year. This is something we should take seriously and compare against the benefits that we've talked about before, which are, I think, very, very substantial and, and I think uh, would, would uh, accrue to many, 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 many more children than the, than the, the, than, uh, than the Kawasaki's. I think we have to take into account all of these risks, but on balance, I am very strongly in favor of, of, uh, of this, this sort of effort to safely reopen youth sports. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya. Uh, really important points. Uh, the only one I would uh, contest is I am not prepared to uh, concede to you the distinction of being the worst athlete on the <laughs> team. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Reagans, uh, you are recognized. Uh, thanks for uh, having me here today, uh, Senator Toomey. Um, we are, you know, we're encouraged. Um, this, this, this pandemic the pause, this forced pause has, has really changed the lives of, of young people around the world and, and, and potentially impacted a generation of young people for, for many years to come. And, and this, this pandemic has, has taken, has taken proms, has taken graduations, has taken um, economic capabilities of parents and families. It's, it's, it's taken um, from, from our America's youth. And what it has done, it also has reinforced you know, the importance of and the significance of, of sport, particularly baseball and softball and how it is the, the fabric of, of our young people today. They wanna play, young people want to play. Uh, they, they are clamoring for that social interaction that they had in school with their classmates, they're, they're, they have a strong desire to, to have that emotional bonding that they experience while they're on the diamond. Uh, they, they yearn for the opportunity to be with their friends on a daily basis and practice and, and get out there and play the game. So there is a, a, a deep desire to get out there as it relates to young people and get back on the diamond. I, I think what we have to do is we're going to get through this at some point um, and we're going to get to the other side. And I think there's going to be great opportunities there as well. And I think it's incumbent upon us to learn from, from this experience and be better um, and, and, and share best practices as we move forward. I think the, the use of technology is something that we, 
we hadn't done prior to this in terms of the RBI program, reviving baseball in inner cities. Um, the use of technology, virtual training, uh, virtual instruction. Baseball is a game of, in, uh, of repetition. And you know, we've learned that we, we've been able to provide a consistent uh, uh, a template for, for instruction uh, through technology, something that we hadn't done and something that we'll continue to utilize on the other side of this pandic pandemic. Uh, the other thing I'm encouraged about is I think there's an opportunity that, uh, that exists in the area of, of free play and play that is more localized, play that, um, that, that may not be cost prohibitive. And I think that there's an opportunity that we, we may see a resurgence of, of local league, league play. I think organizations like uh, Little League, like Steve, that Steve leads, um, I think that there's an opportunity there to be, to be better, to, to, to grow, to, to get more young people playing because of uh, the economic, economic impact that, that families have had to endure through this time. So um, there are some encouraging signs there. I think from us, from, as it relates to RBI, um, we, we've seen a, an uptick in registrations with kids um, with the hope of being able to play this summer. So there are a lot of encouraging signs out there that, uh, that speak to getting back onto the field as soon as possible. Um, obviously, we want to be safe. Uh, we want to have protocol in place that will protect the, the, the young people as, as much as we can, protect families as much as we can. But um, at some point during the summer, we wanna get back onto the field. And the last piece that I would wanna to speak to is um, the African-American minority communities, uh, Latin communities have been impacted by this virus in a, in, in a deep and significant way. Um, you know, I am concerned about you know, the opportunities that lie ahead. I don't know if there'll be less opportunities because of the, the access to leagues or the access to, to funding, uh, families being impacted in a deep way in the, in the African-American communities, um, or will there be uh, more opportunity because of the idea that there may be more free play available and there may be uh, leagues available that, that don't involve charter fees and, and some of the more expensive offerings that are out there uh, there may be a ch an opportunity to be more attractive in terms of localized play because I, I think we can look for ways to to be economically prudent in what we do move forward in, in terms of offering our sport. So um, I, I think that there's a, a real good chance for us to to do um, great things, to learn from from this experience, to be better than we were before, to to use technology to our advantage to, to create more opportunities for, for young people around the world. So thank you again, uh, Senator Toomey, for creating this forum. Thank, thank you, Mr. Reagans. Uh, and now Mrs. Finch, you are recognized uh, for your opening comments. Thank you, Senator Toomey. It's an honor to be here. And we all know firsthand, I know firsthand, I've lived it as an athlete. My, my world was, was sports. I had two older brothers. Um, I watched the Dodgers and Lakers growing up, and that's what brought our family together. And I will forever treasure those, those memories and those opportunities. I went on to get my college education paid for through sport. And from there, had the opportunity to represent our country in two Olympics. And I think, yes, all of those accolades are important and amazing and incredible. But most of all, I am so thankful. And now that I'm a mother of three kids, I see the values that are instilled that transcend way beyond any playing field. And that's what I'm all about instilling and in, in, um, driving into our kids, teamwork, leadership, discipline, sacrifice, all of those things that sport teaches you. And um, as a mom of three, like I said, my oldest is 14, my youngest is seven. They're all actively involved in numerous sports right now. It's travel baseball, softball season for us. And, um, it's been really, really hard to, to see them isolated. And luckily we're down in, in Sulphur, Louisiana. So we have kind of open spaces or in a more rural area. So they've been able to get outside and do things. And I couldn't imagine not being able to, to do those things. And I know um, being an ambassador for Major League Baseball, we've done a lot with the MLB at Home Initiative, Play Ball Initiative, trying to be creative and thinking ways of, of 
being able to encourage kids to stay active in, in a five by five space, whatever they have, you know, thinking of little drills and, and such, just trying to be creative. And, and we've done a lot of virtual clinics and such, but I know for me, my, my world, and the, those are my sisters on the, on the playing field and not being able to see them. And now seeing our kids have to do without, and obviously safety is first and foremost, and, and all of those sacrifices are, are, are nothing compared to what our, our medical responders and our, our, you know, medical field personnel are doing on the front lines to keep us safe. And we're, we're very grateful for that. And so, yes, it's, it's crucial. I, I hold a world series here in, in Sulphur, Louisiana, our hometown. It's, um, $4.7 um, economical impact that we had to cancel this year for our small town of Sulphur, Louisiana, just for that one week tournament. And so I know local businesses, how, how bad that hurts for um, being able to, you know, cancel the, the summer season for what is to come for our, for our small town here. Um, but I'm so thankful for, for sports and I'm looking forward to getting back in. We started practice last week with our three kids and we were very apprehensive. And actually we were the only parents that were apprehensive out of all of them. They took a poll and we were the only ones that weren't sure about it. But I think, again, we start local and then you go out from there. Would, would we go to a tournament right now? I'm not quite sure, but you know, um, you take all the necessary precautions and I think as time passes too, you know, all of, all of the information we gather as we can figure out the best way to move forward with safety first, but also like the doctor was saying too, there's so many risks. And I think, you know, we're, depression, anxiety, isolation is not good for the human soul as well, especially for our young people. Thank you very much, Mrs. Finch, for those comments. I really appreciate it. Uh, next up, Mr. Rollins, you are recognized. Thank you, Senator Toomey. Uh... It's a pleasure to be here to talk about, you know, the impact of sports, uh, the RBI program, and just getting our kids back active. Um, I see it firsthand. I have three daughters, and they're in dance gymnastics. And the youngest, she just kind of does whatever she wants to do. She goes back and forth. But um, baseball, softball, being outdoor sports, which the doctor said will prob probably be the best place to start. We understand that as you're indoors, the virus has a better chance of spreading. So why not be outdoors? We wear masks. If you're around people, we, we understand the social distancing and the importance of PPE, but we don't wanna stop living our lives. We don't wanna stop having our normalities uh, from existing. And right now, none of that exists. We're sitting there watching reruns. We watch the news, we hear about the negative things, but we should be focusing on what we can do instead of what we can't do and working on getting back to what we can do and what we aren't doing. So I'm looking forward to RBI, seeing how it responds. Under um, When I was growing up, I was a part of the RBI program. Fortunately, in the Bay Area, it is baseball rich. So I can't say it was a, it was a program there specifically that had a significant impact because we were already involved in baseball. We had the Oakland A's, we had the San Francisco Giants. So if you didn't love baseball, it was almost like, what was wrong with you? But we know in many places where kids don't have a chance to do anything other than basketball or maybe football, here's a chance to introduce them to a new sport, a, a sport where you literally sit there and rely on the next person to do their job. So I've learned a lot of patience through baseball growing up. It was always patient. I can only have one at bat. I only get one chance to field the ball. I only get one chance to make a throw. Then we're on to the next and I execute or I don't. And it's like that for everyone on that field. The pitcher makes one pitch at a time. The hitter gets one chance to hit it. So you learn to lean on others, to trust in others. And as kids, and whether you have kids or nieces and nephews, you understand they're, they're selfish. Everything is mine, 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 mine. In sports, there, there is no mine. It's ours. Everything has to be shared. A ball has to be shared. A field has to be shared. A dugout, a space. You have to understand how to work with others, how to get along with others. That there are some people you know you are not going to like, but how can you make it work? Those are things that I learned through sports, RBI. You know, put you in that situation where you don't know any of these kids, but you have to come together as a team and figure out how to go out there and, and win a baseball game. But more importantly, how to work with each other, how to be friends, and how to make it work. So it'd be interesting how Major League Baseball uh, implements RBI going forward under the new rules, how much it will step up 
Um, we know that we've lost a lot of athletes to other sports and continuously uh, that happens, especially in inner cities. The attraction of baseball just isn't there as it is for uh, basketball and football. You know, they, they see the quick life or the quick way to the NBA or, or college sports. Uh, and baseball, it's a, it's, 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 a much, it's a much longer road. But the longevity you get out of, of that and the lessons, the life lessons you learn, I think, are just as important as they are in any other sport. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm loving hearing all the different opinions and getting the information and just can't wait to get the kids out there. Thanks very much, Mr. Rollins. Some great points. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, and now, uh, Mr. Keener, you are recognized for your opening remarks. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Senator Toomey, for hosting this uh, panel discussion and, and, and roundtable. Uh, and, and thank you personally. I know, I know how much you support uh, youth sports, uh, particularly being here in Pennsylvania with you. Uh, I, I see that. So uh, we're, we're grateful for that. You know, I, I won't repeat a lot of the the things that, you know, Dr. J and, and Tony and Jenny and Jimmy all stated very eloquently the benefits of, of playing Little League Baseball, Little League Softball, whether it's RBI, wh whatever the program may be, the benefit of, of being involved in youth sports. So I, I, won't, I won't go back and repeat some of those things because I concur with them wholeheartedly. Obviously, this in pandemic has had a devastating impact on families, businesses, communities, and, and, and obviously youth sports. And, and from Little League International's perspective, we've taken the position that we wanted to try to put the importance of youth sports in perspective. And, and, and by that, I mean, <clears throat> understanding that, that one thing that's been a very stark reminder to us is how important Little League baseball, Little League softball are to communities, because we've been hearing from our constituents and our affiliates since the middle of March about getting back on the field. When can we do that? How, are we going to, how important this is to communities? But there are a lot of other important things going on that need to be addressed as well. So we've tried to balance the you know, the, the putting the proper perspective in places that, you know, families, economies, businesses, everything needs to get up and running. But as soon as it's safe to do so, that's when we really want to go full steam ahead and, and get back on the playing field to, to play Little League Baseball and Little League Softball. Our job is really to provide resources. Um, Little League is the largest organized youth sports program in the world. We've got 6,500 affiliate programs in 84 countries. Uh, so our, our job is to really pull as many resources together as we can and provide them to our constituents or our affiliate programs. And so we spent a lot of time consulting with people. I'd like to hire Dr. J because I, I could have used him on, uh, with this, but we, we were fortunate to have access to some other medical professionals. Uh, certainly the CDC, and we've talked with numerous public health officials, both at the state level and the, the federal level. And essentially what we've come up with is a, um, uh, a, a best practices of, of resuming play when it's safe to do so. And we just launched that actually yesterday. So your timing is, is, is very good. We actually sent that out to all of our, all of our programs yesterday, and it addresses when, when you get the green flag from your state and local health officials saying it's, it's okay to start these types of activities, then here's the, here's the model, here's the program, here's all the best practices that, are, that we're gonna provide you so that you can go out and do this as safely as possible. We understand there's going to be apprehension, like Jenny indicated, with, you know, that they're a little apprehensive about getting back out of it. And we understand that. So parents are going to have to make those decisions. But what we want to do is show them it can be done, as we think, as safely as possible, as Dr. J alluded to, uh, if you follow these, these guidelines. And that's, that's what we're providing. Um, you, you mentioned when we started, obviously, we, we host the annual Little League Baseball World Series here in Williamsport. Um, we were really kind of forced to cancel 82 regional and seven World Series tournaments uh, for 2020. But those are for different reasons. You know, we bring 150,000 unique people to the central Pennsylvania in middle of August coming from all over the world and many states and got some direction from Governor Wolf and Secretary of Health, uh, Dr. Levine, uh, and really basically said we, we just can't do it. And so we, we made that decision uh, based on their recommendations and, and guidance to do that. It, it very disappointing for a number of reasons. Number one, there's a whole class of 12 year old kids who are not going to have that opportunity to end their little league season in Williamsport. That's a dream of many kids around the country and around the world. Um, it's equally disappointing for the, 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 the people in the greater Williamsport area. It's about a 35 to $40 million uh, economic impact 
uh, to our area, which we certainly understand and recognize that many of the people impacted by that are great friends of ours, strong supporters and, and all those things. So it's very disappointing that, but under, everyone understands we had to do this, but does, it doesn't make it hurt any less, any less to do it. Um, you know, in the, while we've been shut down since basically the middle of March, we've been, been trying to do things to, one of the things we felt was very important was to tr try to continue to promote emotional and mental health well-being while kids were confined to home and parents were having to, you know, Jimmy was joking about, you know, you become a teacher at home and, 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 you know, that's stressful for parents and, and people to have to do. So we've been very fortunate. We have one of the country's leading child psychologists who's on our or was on our international board of directors, he actually just went off, but who has been a great assistance to us in developing tools and information to share with little league parents and families about how to reduce some of that stress and how to, how to sort of take care of your emotional and mental health uh, during this difficult time. We also introduced a program for kids called a Little League Pep Talk, and Jenny was great. Jenny was happy to provide with us with a Little League pep talk it was a social media campaign directed right to the kids about keeping their spirits up and until it was safe to get back out on the field. And very fortunate, we had a, any number of Major League Baseball players and other notable people who, who provided those pep talks. So that was a, was a great initiative as well. And then lastly, um, what we're also doing is, is we feel a, we have a responsibility to try to help address the, the financial impact that this has had on, on local programs. And, uh, you know, as, as Tony mentioned, so we, you know, we're looking at all of the grant programs that we have available to us uh, to see how we may be able to utilize them to help some leagues who are in, you know, suffered a financial hardship because of this. What we've also done is we've waived all of our affiliation fees for 2020. So every Little League program now, there's no cost to participate, to be a member of the Little League program for 2020. And uh, so probably about a million, a million and a half dollars of, of value. But as, as Tony and Jimmy and Jenny can tell you, you know, two, three hundred dollars to a local little league program, that's a that's that's a couple dozen baseballs or softballs that they can buy or help with some other expenses that they have to operate. But we also that's one of the things we'll be looking at working on going forward is how can we, you know, what what can we do to try to help get some of those leagues, particularly like Tony mentioned, in some underserved areas, areas where we, you know, we want to help leagues get back up on their feet and get running again so um that's that's, that's it in a nutshell we're we're really the the resource provider uh, we're fortunate we have a lot of people with expertise we can call on to help us and um you know i, I guess i give a shameless plug to go to littleleague.org and look at our coronavirus uh web it's got all the resources there that anybody wants to wants to take a look at thank you thank you very much uh mr keener i appreciate that so i'm gonna try to uh uh, direct some questions. Uh, if if I didn't direct the question to you and you'd like to add something to the answer, feel free to do that. But um, we are going to need to wrap up at 11. So we're going to be a little bit under the gun. Quick follow up uh, for Mr. Keener uh, with Little League. Uh, you talked about the best practices. If you hadn't mentioned the website, I was going to ask you to do that. Um, but I just want to confirm, I think you said this during your opening comments, but just so that parents who are watching and listening know when you were working on and developing the best practices, the guidelines, the suggestions for how to actually play the game, is it true that you did that in consultation with public health experts, with medical experts, with a lot of outside expertise to guide that process? Yeah, we did. And, and actually the last review we had uh, of it was from the CDC, which came late last week. And that's really what we were waiting for so that we could get it out to, to everybody. But we did talk with medical professionals, folks at the Aspen Institute who have a, a project play program that we're very much involved with. They have a lot of expertise. So yes, we did. We consult with, we don't have that expertise. So we really are relying on the science and the health officials to help us develop it all. Got it. And if there are parents who are, are listening and they're, they're wondering and they're a little apprehensive, understandably, they could go to your website and see exactly what the protocols you're recommending for their local little league uh, and, and teams, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. They, uh, you know, we understand there'll be some apprehension, but uh, sure. it's all there and uh, and they can make their, their best decision for their children and their family. Terrific. Thank you very much. Dr. Bhattacharya, I wanted to ask you a couple of follow-up questions. One, um, Jimmy Rollins touched on, and I wonder if you could uh, elaborate at all 
Um, it, it does seem, the data that I've seen seems to suggest that the outdoor transmission, especially in the summertime, in the sunshine, it seems that that's um, much lower than in an indoor um, setting. Could you comment on uh, what we know about the less, the lower risk of transmission in uh, an outdoor setting? Mr. Rollins is exactly right. There's, there's a lot of evidence that the virus spreads much more effectively in indoor settings, especially in places that are confined, uh, that, that uh, I mean, so famously in nursing homes, hospitals, other settings like that. Uh, the, the outdoor spread of the virus seems much, much less effective. Um, we don't know for certain, of course, about this, the seasonal effects, but, it sure, it, it, but the evidence seems to be growing that uh, that the virus is less uh, sort of less less you know less effective in the in spreading in the sum, in, in summer and warm weather. Um, uh, I mean that's still that's still developing evidence. Um, so I think uh, I think that uh, that that is ac accurate. That's the best of uh, from from what I've seen of the scientific evidence to date. I think that a lot of evidence points to less risk of spread in the sunshine. And, and I, I don't know if you've looked at this particular uh, data for comparison purposes, doctor, but um, my understanding is adverse impact for children, including fatalities, is much, much lower for COVID-19 than it even is for the ordinary flu. Um, is, is that your understanding? I haven't, I haven't seen a direct comparison with the flu, uh, so I, I don't feel comfortable making a, 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 that kind of comparison. I will say that from an absolute point of view, the total number of kids who have died of, since in the U.S. from COVID-19 since the start of the epidemic is 15. Compare that to the hundreds and thousands that have, 100,000 have died almost from, from uh, in other you know, older age categories. The risk to children is much, much lower, orders of magnitude lower, I think, than to, to adults. And in addition, if, if a child does have the virus, probably would be asymptomatic. The data you've seen suggests that it's quite unlikely that the child would pass that on to parents or siblings or grandparents or anyone else. Yeah, it's it's not it's uh, I mean there's a just for everybody, not just for kids. There's a range of, of of presentations for the disease from basically asymptomatic all the way to this the deadly viral pneumonia. Um, for kids, uh, the, the they you know they may have some symptoms, but it's very unlikely that they get the very the, the deadly viral pneumonia where they end up in the hospital. Much much less likely than adults. Right. Thank you very much, doctor. Um, question for Tony Reagans. Um, so I, I, I understood from your comments that you think there is some real enthusiasm out there for, on the part of kids to get back on the field. Um, so if we were to begin to start opening and following safety protocols, do you think there'd be a lot of kids wanting to participate? Absolutely. I think at the end of the day, um, parents are going to control um, the rate that the kids get out there. I think that there is a, de a desire to, to get out onto the field and play, play sport, uh, baseball and softball. Uh, but the parents are going to be, have to be comfortable with, with getting out there. I think uh, I've, I've had a chance to speak to enough organizations around the country that are, are taking the necessary precautions to, to move forward. Um, I think there's going to have to be a, a comfort level from parents and, um, to allow uh, their children to get out onto the diamond. I think once that happens, um, you're going to, to see a, a lot of activity, activity this summer. I'm hearing a lot of activity taking place beginning this weekend, in, in fact. So, um, but parents are going to be the ultimate de de factors in turn determining whether uh, they get back on the field. I think Jenny spoke uh, pretty well to the fact that there was some apprehension um, initially. But um, yeah, once you get out there, the game is the game. And if the, all the necessary precautions are taken and the pro protocols are followed, um, I think um, the chances of us being out there and being safe um, are greatly enhanced. And, and could you briefly touch on, uh, especially reviving baseball in inner cities and what that can mean for these kids? We have on this panel some superstars from baseball and softball. Most kids will never be professional players, will never be superstars. But... How do they benefit despite the fact that they'll probably have an adult life in which they spend most of their time in some other, some other activity, some other job, some other profession? Sure. Uh, you know, Jimmy is one of the, the chosen few that, that was able to participate in the RBI program and then have a 17 year career at the major league level. The lion's share of young people that are involved in the RBI program or in baseball and softball in general 
you know, they won't make it to, to the major league level. Uh, they may make it to pro ball. They may make it to college, but they the chances of them getting it to that level is, is, you know, is, is slim. Right. But what's more important and really the RBI program speaks to is becoming a good citizen, going back into your community and then being an asset into that community. And we have uh, countless numbers of, of young people that have gone to, through the program, graduated college and, and done something else in, in life, whether they're teachers, police officers, nurses, nurses um, in the armed forces, their assets in, in their community. And I think that's what RBI is about. It's just not about playing baseball and softball. It's about being productive, being, being an asset to your community and then paying it forward, uh, teaching the, you, the, the people that are behind you. So um, the program that, that we have in place, it's been around for many, many years now. And, uh, you know, the baseball component is just, a, just, a, just one piece of, you know, the overall plan to enhance uh, positive citizens in, in the uh, underserved communities. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Finch, I, kind of a similar question for you. Uh, through your work as Major League Baseball's first youth softball ambassador, you're interacting, you're seeing the impact of this program on, on young girls uh, across the country. Can you just share a little bit more from your perspective, the benefits that they get from playing organized softball, even if they're never going to have a career in it? Absolutely. I have some incredible stats to share with you. Um, from the Women's Sports Foundation. And when females are involved in high school af um, athletics, they're 92% less likely to get involved with drugs, 80% less likely to get pregnant, three times more likely to graduate than non-athletes. And if that doesn't speak to itself, you know, I, I've seen it over and over. Sports have transformed young women, especially. And with those staggering numbers, we got to get these <laughs> kids back out on the, on the playing field. And like I said before, I I was apprehensive and especially now after hearing uh, Dr. J speak, I'm ready to go. But we <laughs> did go out there and to see my kids jumping around and so pumped and excited and, and the life instilled in them again. And obviously safety's first, you know, I'm, I'm a parent, I'm a mom, um, but therefore we're going to move forward. Obviously we're hopefully going to get back to where it's been. It's going to be a changed new normal but at the same time, you know, if, if everyone is on the same board and the communication is there and those steps of, of safety are taken, then I, f I do feel comfortable. And, I, and I'm so thankful for this roundtable because it is um, a huge step in moving forward and, and figuring out and collaborating with, with everybody involved in all areas of, of the field in order to get these kids back out there around their teammates playing. And again, practice, it's a controlled environment. It's our kids. It's, it's you know, parents were left aside. We were spaced out. Um, the kids were on there and, and one of my teams, we had a, a practice of half the team and then, and then the other half came two hours later. So taking those steps to, to figure out how we do move forward. So I, I did want to follow up on that very uh, topic because I'm, I'm hoping that I can soon have my 10 year old uh, back on the little league field. You already have your children out on the field. How is it working? Uh, the, the protocols that you're following, do, do, do they work? Can you still play the game? Is it still fun? Is it, do these, these measures seem to make sense to you? What, what's your reaction to the, the new circumstances? You know, I was very pleased. I was, like I said, I was apprehensive and, and we are, each coach took a poll and we were the only parents that were kind of nervous. Everyone else had been gung ho, ready to go for the last three weeks, you know, to get out there. And so we, you know, each, each kid had hand sanitizer. They, you know, spaced out their bat bags. And um, again, with the numbers that Dr. J came out with, I'm more than confident to have these kids out there with, with one another. And these kids, we, you know, we know their families, they're coming together, um, being as safe as they can, moving forward, playing. I, I'm, my eight-year-old was counting down the minutes to practice. And then afterwards, like, this was the best day of my life. And so <laughs> to see that reaction and the joy that sports brings firsthand as a mom, it, 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 was, it was great. Yeah, terrific. Thank you so much. Um, Jimmy Rollins, um, let, let me ask you, uh, it, with assuming that the proper protocols are being followed and they're all in place, would you feel comfortable letting your children play for their local teams? I definitely would, um, given uh, the information that we have today, uh, understanding what protocols will be in place uh, to make everyone comfortable. Uh, obviously, 
Um, it's going to be up to the parents and their comfort level and what they do. But I will talk to my children. How do they feel? We all know they want to be around their friends. And children are very aware of what's happening. They understand about space. They understand about PPE. And this person doesn't have a mask. And why are they so close? They get that. Um, so as long as they're comfortable and I understand what's happening to make everyone safe, I'm okay with it and taking the fact that it's outdoors. We've been outdoors already. We take walks around the neighborhood. We've been on trails, understanding that space is the best thing for us. And baseball and softball, you naturally are getting that space. The catcher, umpire, batter, okay, maybe not so much, but you're not standing in someone's face for 10 minutes, which is they saying is, is, is the number. You, you get in there, you get a couple of pitches, you run to the bag and, and, and you're gone. But more importantly, the kids, they need that. They need that interaction. Uh, yesterday was my daughter's birthday and they've been out of school for, I don't know, a month, month and a half. A drive-by party, not the pool parties, not everybody <laughs> over. That was the best party ever. I'm just like, really? It was that simple. But it was the fact that they've been isolated for so long from their friends. They Zoom all the time, but there's nothing like that human interaction. And when you get back on the field and the kids are back around each other, I think, as, as Jenny was saying, you're very apprehensive, but you see the excitement and enjoying your kid's face. You start to relax, understanding that they're safe and they're getting back to something that's normal for them. And I know you're an alumnus of uh, MLB's Reviving Baseball Inner Cities program, and you've worked an awful lot with, with kids. Um, do you share Tony Reagan's view that there's a lot of pent up demand? There's a lot of kids who'd love to be getting a chance to be back on the diamond. Oh, I definitely do. I, 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 I think it's really an opportunity for baseball to be revived in the inner cities. Like I said, we, we've lost so many athletes at other sports. They're the glamour sports and they seem like the fast way out. So baseball is kind of taking a back seat. We understand the expense. Um, here's an opportunity for the local teams to really grab a hold of those kids and bring them back in like we can do this here. And speaking of RBI, Tony brought up a, a point about creating better people. And it just reminded me of Jethro McIntyre, who was still, I think he just retired a couple years ago from running an RBI uh, program in Oakland. And his number one thing wasn't baseball. We got to the field. We were at Laney College, JUCO. We sat in the stands and he checked everyone's temperature. If you weren't willing to participate and be a team player, you weren't on the field until you were ready. And that was a lesson like baseball. Yes, you're going to play. But the number one goal is to have the right attitude. With the right attitude, you can join any team. With the bad attitude, you'll be on the outside looking in. Yeah. Um, Mr. Rollins, I, there's one thing in, in your background that's just fascinating, and, and I wonder if you would just uh, touch on it briefly, and that's your work in Uganda and uh, bringing Little League players to Citizens Bank Park. Uh, what was that like, and what was it like for those kids? That was an awesome experience. Uh, we got to go over to Uganda first. Myself, uh, Derek Lee, um, Ruth, I can't remember her last name, the lady in, in Canada who was over the uh, Canadian uh, little league teams there and, and making it all happen. But I saw the story on ESPN um, about how the kids were basically denied the opportunity to come over here. They they won outright. They beat Saudi Arabia and had an opportunity to come to play in the Little League World Series. But uh, they were denied entry because they didn't have proper paperwork. So Ruth put together um, all the people she reached out, reached out to the kids, although they went on to start playing other sports, got everyone back together to go to Uganda to give them their Little League World Series experience. And um, it, was, it was a great opportunity for the kids to see where they measured up all their hard work, creating fields out of nothing. I mean, just, just, just destroying everything they had to give it all for baseball and to go over there and see it actually come to life was awesome. But the better part was they won again. And this time they were accepted to come. They, they, they were allowed entry to the U.S. to participate in the Little League World Series. And that, and that was their dream. They, it, it, was, it was from nothing from the ghettos to literally plant on fields where cows were grazing to be able to be in Williamsport and experience the Little League World Series, which was something that they had rightfully earned. So, I mean, I, I, it, was, it was a pleasure to be a part of. Um, I just happened to turn on ESPN that day and catch the story. And I'm so happy I did because my life has been changed. I'm still in contact with the kids. I'm still in contact with the coaches. We email, we DM, uh, they Facebook me, everything. So um, it's a life experience and something that I will have, have forever. 
That is a fantastic story. Thank you so much for that. I do want to put in a plug. If anybody who's on the panel or watching this has not had a chance to go to Williamsport, Pennsylvania to watch the World Series, it will be back. Right, Mr. Keener? It will be back. It will be, yeah, it's an it'll be stronger than ever. And it's an amazing experience, obviously, for the kids. But as a spectator, I've been there with my family, and we just had one fantastic time. I've just got one final question, and I did promise we'd finish this up by 11. And my last question is, is to Jimmy Rollins. I think we've got a reasonable chance of having at least an abbreviated Major League Baseball season. How are the Phillies going to do? <laughs> they better do well. <laughs> That's, that's what they better do. It, look, uh, look we're, not, we're not trying to wait another 30 years for a parade and have all the pieces in place, so they better do well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd absolutely be up for a parade in the fall. Well, I, I can't thank you guys enough. I've, I've found this very, very informative, very instructive. I'm sure people watching have learned an awful lot, and uh, I, I am very grateful. Uh, let's continue the dialogue, and thanks for all that you're doing for the youth of America. Hey, thanks for having us, Senator. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Thank you.